Greetings from the pastor's office and welcome to our online Bible study, The Beatitudes. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, as I've said in past videos, I would encourage those that are new to us to check out the other videos in the sermon series, in this sermon series, in this Bible study series. I'll add a playlist card at the top of the uh, video. Really, to get the full benefit of, of any study, it would be best to go through the complete series. Uh, and also, this will be the last video in these series as we, we come to the last beatitude of Matthew's Gospel. And I would encourage you in the days forward to make the Sermon on the Mount a regular part of your Bible reading. It's a really important part of, the, of, uh, of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And if you choose just maybe to keep the Beatitudes in the regular part of your diet of Bible reading, I'm sure you'll be blessed in your relationship with God and you will grow deeper and deeper in your relationship. Uh, check out the description section of the video for any references and resources that I will include. Please make use of the comment section, ask questions, share your, your points or something that feel, you feel that God has revealed to you. And really my prayer and hope for you and for me is that uh, during our time together that we'll grow in the knowledge of God and, and His amazing grace. So let's get right to it. Uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 10 through 12. The beatitude is found in verse 10. Uh, and it goes like this. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus expands on, on what that means in verse 11 and 12. Following, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, as we go all the way back to the very beginning of this study, uh, we stated, uh, it was stated, that the Beatitudes are to be taken as a whole, and that there was a natural progression from the first through to the last. And as we come to this last Beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we want to take a moment and look at the progression and how it applies to verse 10 today. And it goes something like this. A believer who has realized their poverty in spirit, uh, their need for God, and laments over their sin against a holy and just and righteous God. One who is meek like a servant, serving others, uh, has reordered their life and lives a, a, a lifestyle which pursues righteousness and holiness. Uh, one who is a merciful person, one who has a pure heart and seeks to not only be, keep the peace, but to make peace, to be a peacemaker, that believer is guaranteed to encounter, as according to verse 10 here, uh, opposition. And that believer may be persecuted. So what was Jesus teaching his disciples, his followers? That there will be opposition, that there will be persecution, and that's a normal part of a Christian's life. We go to John's Gospel, chapter 15, and we read in John 15, verse 18, Jesus speaking to his disciples, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Then uh, later Jesus said in uh, John 15, 20, Remember the words I spoke to you, No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. The Apostle Paul, writing to his protege, Timothy, in his second letter, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12 and 13, writes, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now that's quite a, quite a prophecy there when we look around at our current situation in uh, North America, for sure, and even in the West in general. So what does this all mean? Well, when you follow Jesus, when you hunger for righteousness, when you practice self-control and sexual purity in our present situation, and even in Paul's day, and even in Jesus' day, you will find opposition. 
You see, people who do not value those things, people who do not see your life as you see it, biblically grounded, centered on Christ, when this happens, when they see your life, your behavior, they see that as a condemnation on, on their own behaviors. So what happens then? Well, maybe some of you have experienced this. You'll be pressured to conform. You know, and not necessarily as a society as a whole, per se, at this moment. Maybe it is. But certainly in your workspace, maybe even in your family, when you have many family members or a large family that are not Christians, you'll be pressured to conform to, into their behavior, their attitude. You might even be demeaned because of your, your allegiance to Jesus Christ. You might even be labeled, for example, oh, you're a holier than thou, or you're a Bible thumper, etc. So here's the point. When you live a holy life, when you live a life like Jesus lived, and you follow his teachings and you obey his commandments, uh, as we find here in these Beatitudes, uh, this will convict people of their unrighteousness. Just simply living those out, you don't even have to be saying anything. Uh, you just be not joining them in their dispensation, if you will, or in their unrighteousness. I'll give you an example from my own experience. Spent many years in the military full time. Friday was always beer call. Would I go to beer call? Sure, I would. Would I drink copious amounts of alcohol and beer and stuff like that? Of course not. In that situation, I chose not to drink alcohol at all. Now, Christians are in different places when it comes to alcohol. And I don't want to get into that debate here. The point of that story is uh, I found a way where I could go and be with those that I work with so not to come off as someone that was snobbish, but I would not join them in their drunkenness. As a matter of fact, I would offer my services as a, as a, uh, a driver so I would be able to take them home if they wished. Uh, and I would ensure they got home safely. That's just an example in my own life. So, so they might be called holier than thou. Uh, when you live your life uh, like Jesus and his teachings, you'll find here in the Beatitudes, uh, others will be convicted of their unrighteousness, of their own sin. And when we do uh, receive opposition, this text tells us quite clearly when we are persecuted or receive opposition for righteousness sake, and that's why we are doing it. That's why we, we would receive opposition is for righteousness sake. Uh, Peter, writing in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 14, uh, writes this, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Really, the only opposition or persecution, if you will, that is blessed is that which comes from our faithfulness to Jesus Christ. You know, we live in, uh, in crazy times these last uh, at least half a year and for lots of other reasons besides COVID-19. And people are protesting in the streets and maybe even those uh, that might call themselves Christians out there and they're involved in all that. Well, for whatever reason that I see this and understand this, uh, when we are persecuted for our, for our faith in Christ, the only way we'll be blessed if we do it for righteousness' sake. Okay, so opposition that comes from living in obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of things there that we have to deal with when it comes to everything from abortion all the way through to uh, what the Bible tells us about marriage, uh, what that looks like, etc. Those things there, we will find opposition in our culture. So any op a persecution that comes our way should be because simply because of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't take too much time. I already have alluded to it in my conversation with you. Uh, as we look around our current uh, post-Christian culture, following Jesus is not a very trendy thing to do. It's not something people are doing. And those who are true believers following the bi biblical example of Christianity, uh, they're often viewed as being exclusive and uh, often viewed as being an even to the point of being a danger to the current culture and society. This would have been the case uh, eventually in the first century. 
So let's talk about forms of persecution. Now, we're not going to get into too much details here, but some forms of persecution. Uh, typically, maybe in the West here or in Canada, we'll talk about Canada, maybe even our own area here in Alberta, you might have some name-calling, uh, some labeling, so name-calling, oh, you're a bunch of hypocrites, or oh, you're power-hungry, or oh, you're stupid, you don't understand anything. Uh, labeling Christians such as bigots and hypocrites and all the other stuff I said about name-calling. See, the interesting thing about this, while Christians can be the target uh, for, for these, this kind of opposition, the spiritual reality that's underlying there is, is that people who refuse to acknowledge their sinfulness and their need for God, for forgiveness, for a right standing with God through Christ, for those people who re refuse to, to acknowledge their sinfulness before a holy and just God, are in essence really mocking God when they oppose or persecute Christians. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8 tells us, is, uh, tells us clearly that they are deceived. Uh, for example, we'll read here in 7 and 8, uh, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So there we have that one form of uh, persecution that we're talking about here, name-calling, labeling. And we could get into even more layers, you know, uh, jobs and stuff like that, but, uh, uh, you know, employment and everything else like that. But let's move into the more one that people kind of think of when we think of it here in the West, physical abuse or even death. Now, persecution is one coin. There seems to be two sides to it. There's the more, you know, subvert, some more, more under the underlying persecution and then the obvious overt um, physical abuse and death of Christians. Well, in the West, we have yet to see this come to a great extreme. I'm, I have actually heard of no one in my area here or even in Canada have been killed because they're Christians. Uh, they might have been, I just have not been aware of it. But this is not something that's really common right now at this time in Canada, for say, in USA, in the West in particular. But in many places in the world uh, around us, this is a common occurrence. And uh, physical abuse and death, slavery, we, we hear about that all the time in Africa with Boko Haram, uh, kidnapping Christian, uh, Christian women and using them as uh, slaves and for their sexual purposes. And uh, a real uh, great organization I want to point you to at this time concerning this kind of persecution is a, a group called the Open Doors. And there's a, uh, they're a worldwide, uh, I think, uh, organization. I don't know too much about them. But uh, here in Canada, we have uh, Open Doors, uh, CA.org. And I was just on their site, and I just noticed a couple items there, and I want to share with you this one, this one stat that I found on Open Doors website. Approximately 250 million Christians are persecuted annually in this century uh, for their faith in Jesus Christ. And that's a lot of people. So we talked about all sorts of things now. Let's talk about the reward. What is the reward, you think, for a for a faithful, Bible-believing follower of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus tells us the reward is that you will rejoice and be glad. Now, that sounds like a contradiction, an oxymoron, doesn't it? I'm going to be glad because someone punches me in the face because I'm a Christian or calls me a name or labels me or I can't get a job because I'm a follower of Jesus Christ or whatever else could or possibly might happen or might not ever happen. Or if I was in another country where a persecution uh, turned at even a higher level as a physical abuse or death, you know, forced maybe to denounce Jesus Christ and, and refusing to do so, I would be put to death. Uh, the reward is rejoicing and, and be happy. Well, let's look at that in verse 12, rejoice and be glad, that phrase. What does that mean? Well, it really has a sense of intense happiness, intense joy. It's something that brings a jump to a person's, you know, like a, a light step to a person's uh, day. It brings possibly tears of joy. And I want to give you two reasons why Christians can rejoice in opposition to their allegiance to Jesus Christ. 
Two reasons. One, believers will have a great reward in eternity. You know, friends, this world is a temporary situation. You wouldn't think of that way uh, we're going down some of these uh, cultural phenomenons that we've seen in the last 50 years. Uh, but yes, this world is a temporary situation. Jesus has yet to return. When, and when Jesus comes again, when Jesus comes again, he's going to settle all accounts. Everyone will get their just desserts, the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. And believers will receive their resurrected bodies, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Read that for yourselves. And all things will be renewed. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And here's the summation of all of that. Revelation 21.7, God speaking through the Apostle John, said this, I will be their God and they will be my children. No more sin, no more wars, no more nothing like that. No more tears, no more pain. The resurrected body will be immortal. The resurrected body will be glorified, just like Jesus is glorified in his body. And all accounts will be settled. And that's one great reason that we can endure what comes our way this side of heaven. Uh, we will have a great reward in eternity. Point number two, believers are in good company. This is not an unusual thing. Godly people, those that have followed God, have put their faith and trust in God and followed Him all their lives, uh, have been opposed and persecuted. I'll give you a place to go to, a Herb, Hebrews chapter 11. This is the, um, basically the chapter of heroes is what I call it. And I just want to pick it up in verse 35, verse 35b in reference to all the prophets that went ahead of us, all those faithful followers of God that have gone ahead of us. We read this in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 35. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released, so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so, they, that, they, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So, two reasons... We can rejoice in opposition as followers of Jesus. One, we have a great reward awaiting for us in eternity. And two, we are in good company. So what's the takeaway from this? What's the takeaway? What can we, what can we take away into our day, into tomorrow and next? Well, because of Jesus Christ, Christians are different than the rest of the world. I like, I have, I've, always, I've often thought of it this way in my own life. Um, first 30 years, I was walking in the desert, and the next last 31 years, now I'm getting old, I've walked with Christ. Uh, and it's been a growing relationship. It's been a maturing process. Things that I thought about and believed about Jesus or the Bible have changed over time. It hasn't changed my faith in God. It hasn't changed my faith. It's biblically grounded. It is, it's become more solid than ever but it's a growing thing. So I look at it this way. I do not march by the drumbeat of the world. Now, I'm not talking about mountains and lakes and oceans. I'm talking about the world system. I do not march by their drumbeat. I march by the drumbeat that God has placed into my heart. I am different than those who do not follow Jesus Christ. I'm different not only in my attitudes and behaviors and my worldview. I'm different in every way. Not perfect, but different for sure. Christians walk daily with Jesus, and they walk like Jesus did. And how did Jesus walk? He walked in submission to and obedience to God the Father. Jesus, Christians uh, are different than the rest of the world when they live out the Beatitudes. We've been talking about those through this whole series. 
Believers foster a merciful heart. They are merciful toward all people, not just brothers and sisters in common, but also all other people in the world. Believers pursue purity and holiness in the midst of a sexually obsessive society. And when they need help, they seek help. <laughs> Thought I'd throw that one in. Uh, they pursue a peacemaking attitude, not just a keeping the peace attitude, but a peacemaking, being part of the solution. They seek just, they help to seek justice, even though perfect justice is not going to happen on the side of, of heaven. They're part of the solution, not part of the problem. They keep the peace as best as they can. They don't go riot in the streets. They don't tear down monuments. You know, they don't do that kind of stuff, even if that might seem right to some people or even right to a Christian. They don't do violence. Um, and they have a healthy biblical understanding and exegesis and expectation. They know what the Bible says about opposition and persecution to come. And Christians expect opposition and persecution. They know it's going to happen and they expect it. They're not surprised when it happens, even if it's from their own family. So in summation to all this, um, matter of fact, summation to all these videos, but particularly when we're talking about uh, this one here, this beatitude that tells us, that teaches us, I'll get to it. Uh, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's the very end of that? Well, I'll just say what Jesus said. I'll just pass his words on. You are blessed. You are blessed. Well, thank you very much for being part of these uh, videos. Uh, they'll be hopefully up on our our uh, church website. Uh, this last one will be up there when I can get it, get it up on the YouTube channel and then on the Facebook page. Uh, thank you so much for being part of the journey. Uh, please put your comments down there if you have any. I'm not sure if we're, when we're going to be doing another online Bible study. Maybe I'll do a short one, a short uh, series for Advent or for Christmas season. Uh, we'll see. We'll see as the next few weeks go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this. I wish you all the very best and God. Godspeed and, and shalom.